of the TKW podcast with myself, Sean Geddes, and my co-host, Dean Joannou. How are you feeling, Dean? I'm feeling really good. I'm happy with one and one. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good, too. You know, I, I would prefer to be 2-0, and oh, but uh, I like the one and one because I, I think we got the one win was very good. It was decisive. Um, and the one loss, it was a tough game on the road against a tough team. Sure, they were missing a couple of players, which a lot of people seem to want to harp on. But uh, we also are missing a player, one. And Memphis is just a tough team to beat at home. So the fact that we stayed in it, uh, we got it to OT after a really slow start. We played about as poorly as we can play and, you know, took it to overtime and had a couple, you know, a couple of different bounces of the ball. We were 2-0. and So I'm definitely feeling positive there. Uh, what's your, I mean, I guess we can start with the Memphis game. Like, what were your takeaways from the Memphis game? So my takeaway following the Memphis game was confusion. I didn't understand how the Knicks played the Grizzlies that close in Memphis because from a team standpoint, it didn't seem like the most cohesive game. We had some guys with really nice performances, Randall specifically, and of course, Cam Reddish. I thought Fournier played a, a decent game, but the Knicks weren't fi- firing on all cylinders as a team. They still managed to lose by three in overtime with a great look in the corner from Evan Fournier. So all I wanted to see going into the next game was team basketball. I thought we'd beat the Pistons. I thought even if we had an, uh, um, you know, a disjointed game like we had on opening night, we could still beat the Pistons, but I wanted to do it in a decisive fashion. That's exactly what the Knicks did. The Knicks looked like a good, cohesive team in that game. Yeah, exactly. Like that first game, there wasn't a lot of cohesion. I mean, you get three for 18 from RJ Barrett, it's going to be a tough night. Um, Julius Randle looked good. Jalen Brunson struggled in the beginning and also was in foul trouble. Mitch spent the whole game in foul trouble. Um, we got a really, really good game from Cam Reddish. Really happy for that and hoping that he can continue to string that together a little bit uh, while Grimes is out for however long Grimes is going to be out for that we're not being made aware of. Um, and my, I think my favorite thing about the Grizzlies game, even though it was a loss, it was the way we executed down the stretch. Like, you know, and that 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 just goes to show what having a real shout out to Jalen Brunson, 15 turnovers to two games, zero, I mean, 15 assists to two games, zero turnovers. And, you know, it just shows that like having that floor general down the stretch of games is going to make a big difference. And even though it didn't get us to win in that game, it's going to get us some wins because, I mean, like possession after possession, I felt confident in us coming down the floor. Like Memphis is scoring like his job was coming off of that screen and getting that floater and getting all kind of like and one calls, even though he wasn't really getting touched, whatever. Um, and the refs were abysmal in that game also. But, you know, I feel like we came down and, you know, either Jalen got to the basket, he got, you know, the little mid-range pull up, uh, him and Julius ran pick and roll. We just like, we looked like we had a plan. Like in games last year down the stretch, we lost so many close games and so many, moved so many leads because for the last five, six minutes of the game, we would come down the court not be able to get into a set, not be able to run any real offense, start start trying to get into the offense with seven seconds left on the shot clock and end up forcing a bad shot. And there was just none of that. It was really, you know, it was good execution down the stretch of the game. And it was really nice to see. And I thought that would go a long way for us in these close games. Um, and then in the Pistons game, like you said, it was that we, we did what we were supposed to do. Like, we blew them out. And a lot of people are like, oh, you know, it's just the Pistons. Like, people are going to – people are very annoying. And to that, I say, like, you can only play the team you're playing. And so play them as well as you can. And that's what we did. We had a 24-point lead, a 24-point win. We, we won it comfortably. We were, like, you know, very rarely were in a situation where we were nervous at all. Uh, at one point, they cut our lead to 12, and then the bench came out and smacked them. And so, you know, I, I, I'm really proud of the bench for that game because they, uh, they had a slow night in Memphis, but they really bounced back. I feel like we saw we saw everybody play well, even though we didn't see anybody play like super great, like uh, outside of quick with 27 and seven and 27 minutes. Nobody had like this, you know, like quick led the team, I believe in points 
assists and was second in rebounds. And so nobody had like this crazy scissor game, like 30 points. Like it was just a very, very solid night from everybody. And so everybody doing what they can do. And, you know, the more nights we get like that, we're going to be in really good shape. So I'm, I'm happy about, I'm happy about one and one. And we're recording this on Sunday, by the way, guys. So the Magic play on Monday. We play the Magic on Monday, but we don't have that game here. But for the first two games, very happy with one and one Yeah, and I think there's plenty to talk about through these two games. And one storyline that I'm watching for, and it's actually the same way that I felt coming into last season, was, okay, I think the bench is going to be phenomenal. Is the starting lineup going to be better? So two years ago was that starting lineup that, you know, the, the classic meme, same five to start tonight. I won't say any names. And um, that starting lineup didn't, you know, Julius Randle was amazing, but that unit itself didn't perform at a super high level. I think they were a plus 0.1. They were neutral. That's not terrible. And that was a decent model at the time is to have neutral play with your starting lineup and then your bench goes crazy on people. So in last year, I was looking for the same thing. The bench remained very good, but the starting lineup left a lot to be desired defensively, especially with Kemba Walker and with Evan Fournier. And now coming into this year, once again, with the bench, I'm looking for them to be elite. That's how I'm measuring this bench. Like, did they win their minutes? I need more than that. I want them to dominate because they're that good as a bench unit. It fits together so well. Hartenstein replacing uh, Taj Gibson, Nerlens Noel. That makes everything tied together even more easily. There's so much playmaking with Cam, um, with, uh, with Emmanuel Quickly, with Derek Rose. Cam Reddish is providing an interesting element. And even Obi's a great passer. But... The starting lineup um, for the first time in a little while, I have a lot of faith in. I'm not sure Fournier is going to hold down that spot all year. I would really like to see Quentin Grimes in there. Um, get well soon, Quentin Grimes. I hope we can find out what's going on with them soon. But I think Jalen Brunson can actually make it a positive, good lineup. Because now Mitchell Robinson can be more of what he's supposed to be on offense with a point guard like Brunson with the kind of craft Brunson has. I mean, Brunson can just take advantage of a lot of things that a good point guard is supposed to take advantage of. Like, is, is Mitch's defender over committing to Mitch because he's scared of the lob? And Jalen Brunson's going to plant, pump fake, get himself a layup. He had a straight post-up bucket against Memphis. Like, back them down, post-hook. And I love that for point guards. It's one of my favorite things. Shout out to Andre Miller. Love watching Andre Miller. So... Um, I was a little skeptical that Brunson would have such a positive effect on Julius Randle, but Julius Randle, I'm pretty sure hasn't turned the ball over at all. Brunson to his credit, hasn't turned the ball over once 15 to zero assist to turnover ratio. And Julius Randle is just not having to overextend himself. He's playing smart. He's playing within himself. He's still playing great. Like Julius can play within himself and still get 24, 25 points. It doesn't have to mean we want him in a different reduced role. Like, no, it's just cleaning up what actions are being run, how much is asked of Randall on the ball. And I think Randall's looked awesome. I think Brunson, Randall, and Mitch, give it a few weeks, maybe a couple months. The chemistry is going to be amazing between those two. No, truly. I, I really, you know, Brunson really has changed a lot for us. And that starting unit, like you said, like the bench is excellent. And we, and we saw an example in Detroit, like our bench had Detroit 41-6. And then at the end of 61-22, like our bench blew them out of the water. And, you know, we did our uh, preview for the matchup with Matt for the Hornets. And even like, it, it sounds like our bench is going to blow their bench out of the water. Like I feel like our bench is going to blow a lot of benches out of the water. And so it's just a matter of the starters being able to handle their job. And the starters are, like, you know, like you said before, it was neutral. That's a good risk. But if the starters are good, that changes a lot for us. And so, you know, Jalen Brunson being able to orchestrate things, Julius Randle, you know, fitting into being able to pick his spots better. Like, I just love the fact, I can't stop saying it, Julius Randle is attacking one-on-one -on -one almost every single time. Like, he's rarely facing doubles. He's not being loaded up against because the offense isn't running through him that way and allows him to pick his spots and be more effective. And it's really nice to see. So yeah, I'm seeing a nice rapport between him and uh, I'm seeing a nice rapport between Brunson and Randall. Um, uh, Brunson and Mitch is going to continue to get better, like you said. Mitch is setting better screens, it seems. Um, and then RJ, RJ got going with his playmaking early in the Detroit game. That was really nice to see, like you know, getting baseline, kicking it out to Fournier, uh, turning the corner, throwing the lob to Mitch, turning the corner again, and making the pass behind Hardenstein. That 
thread of the needle to Julius Randle in transition. Like, you know, I, I love seeing playmaking RJ. Like, he's I, he's such a good playmaker. And, and so, you know, those things all clicking simultaneously will go a long way for us. And it gives us a lot of different ways to attack and a lot of different ways to hurt teams. And like you said, I don't think Fournier will stay in that spot. Um, you know, I'm hoping that Grimes is able to come back healthily. I'm not really sure what's going on with him. I feel like I'd be more comfortable about the Quentin Grimes situation if he didn't play any preseason games at all. But the fact that, like, he was out and then he came and played a preseason game and he's out again and we don't really have any clarity on what's going on, I'm a little unsettled. But, you know, I, I think that ultimately he will take that job and, you know, hopefully Cam continues to produce. But, yeah, like, just the production that we're going to get out of the starting lineup in addition to having a very strong bench, we're a good team, man. I've been trying to tell people we're, we're a good team. It's really as simple as that. The bench is going to win their minutes. I'm very confident in that. Maybe there will be some nights where another team's bench can explode from three, something like that. But if the starting lineup is a genuine positive thing, then like the Knicks ceiling is a lot higher than I was giving them credit for, than a lot of people were. You're seeing a lot of consistency with uh, people's takes on a win-loss record for the Knicks. You're seeing a lot of 42 and 40, 43 and 39. And that's not, that wouldn't be a failure of a season, but if things come together the way it looks like they really could. And once RJ is over his early season, um, you know, getting into a rhythm thing that, that we're seeing so far early, still extremely early. I'm not even saying that's going to continue for three games. Hopefully again, it'll be different against the magic, but by the time everything gels, the Knicks are going to be really good. And the Knicks have the depth to, weather the storm if there's a couple injuries here and there that's the thing as the season goes on some teams that are like objectively of pretty high quality they'll have injuries and there'll be winnable games on your schedule that looking at the schedule today we're thinking oh that's a tough game on february 3rd i wonder who they play on february 3rd if they do but that's a tough game way out in the future and then that time comes they're missing one starter two important bench players and another guy's banged up playing through an injury, and then that's a very win winnable game. So I think the Knicks are going to take care of the wins they're supposed to, like Detroit, and I also love winning by 24 at home on the, in the home opener because now we're plus 24 at MSG. We always are going to watch this. MSG is not the home court advantage that some people think because obviously our crowd is the greatest crowd, uh, bar none in my opinion. I think it should be more than an opinion, but – other players are excited to play there. So like MSG is still a, it's a tough place to play, even if you're at home. But I think we have the kind of guys on the roster right now who like, they're not, they're not worried about the bright lights. They like playing with each other. They're all focused on the same goal. I think the Knicks will protect court, uh, home court well this year. So I'm definitely watching for that. Uh, yeah, I also expect us to protect home court, and I'm glad we got off to that start. Like you said, and once again, you can only play the team you're playing. And so there's been times where we would have let the Detroit Pistons turn into a dogfight. We did it last year. And they're a better team than they were last year. And, you know, they had some guys have big, like, you know, people. It's just funny, you know, like, people were saying that, like, over the offseason when people wanted to complain about everything, people were like, oh, Detroit is ahead of us now. Like, they're doing their rebuild better. Like, they're, they've moved ahead of us they've got young talent they got jay and they made moves like we need to be oh blah we let them fleece us for all the second round picks and now we beat detroit by 24 in the home opener and it's oh well they're not a good team it's only detroit and it's just like bro like is it uchi Wally or is it one mike like, you have to pick one you got you can't be angry about both things um and so yeah like you you beat them badly like beat them badly don't let them hang around like show that they are not on the level that we are and that's what we did and if you take care of business against the bad teams, it, like it, you're, it's going to raise your floor. Like if we take, if we make sure we're beating bad teams, like the teams are supposed to be bad teams, teams are supposed to be whatever. If we win those games, we win them handedly. And then we go and we compete against the teams that are tough. And like you said, sometimes they're going to have a guy that's banged up or whatever, like just compete every single night, man. Like, and if you win, let's say you win 80% of the games against teams you're supposed to be. And let's say you win, 40% of the games against teams you're supposed to compete against. I think you end up doing pretty well. Like, I think you end up doing pretty well. You give yourself a shot. And I, I you know, I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm going to look like a prophet 
when I, you know, from when I was saying, hey, like we can make the playoffs and not even really be a playing team. I, I still believe that. And honestly, it, it into the early season, I think we can be better than Philly. Like, I think we can, I, I don't think even Sixers like the way they look. I think we can be a better team than Philly for sure. And, you know, that's that's only a week into the season. Of course, that might be a bold statement, but it's just like as time goes on, like more of these, more of these teams that were penciled in in paper, on paper, to be better than us while we were supposed to fight for a playing seed maybe, you'll start to see that, like, you know, the games are played on the court for a reason. Yeah, it's basically just saying that the Knicks ceiling is higher than some teams' floor who are expected to be really good but you don't know that they'll be really good. Like with the Sixers, I was thinking that the Sixers would be a top two or three seed in the East. Nothing, you know, nothing has changed. It's so early, but it doesn't look good. Um, The outlook with Doc Rivers, the fans are not happy with Doc Rivers right now. Joel Embiid's not in great shape because he had this injury in the off season and he came in a little bit out of shape. Um, They got some new guys. They're trying to make it work, but that's a team with a ton of talent who let's say their floor if things go really poorly is like 45 wins, the Knicks season, the Knicks ceiling is much higher than 45 wins. You know, most people are predicting 42, 43. That's, that's supposed to be the median outcome. That means that the Knicks should have a chance if they, if everything comes together to get in the high forties, maybe win 50 games. I'm sure you wouldn't find that ridiculous. So anything can happen. I'm so glad that the NBA season is back, by the way. I'm so glad we're talking in hypotheticals still, but with some games under our belt, so much better than doing it in the off season because everything goes out the window right away. Literally right yeah. away. And, and um, yeah, as Sean said, we're recording this uh, early on Sunday, so we haven't played the Orlando Magic yet. Definitely hoping. I think that's a game the Knicks are supposed to win, even though I really respect the Magic. As a Knicks fan, you have no choice but to respect the Magic, especially considering they still have Terrence Ross. I don't know what Terrence Ross is still doing there, but I'm going to be terrified every time he touches the ball. And Paolo Bancaro looks amazing uh, so far. So we're definitely not looking past Orlando, but at the same time, we kind of are because we're doing a Charlotte Hornets preview, uh, (laughs) (laughs) which we hope that you enjoy. We had a lot of fun recording it. Facts. No, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to jump out the window and say we took care of the magic on Monday. I really enjoyed that game. Uh, <laughs> you know, l- looking forward to that uh, Julius versus Ben Carroll matchup. I think that Julius is going to take that one very, you know, he has a few of those matchups he takes really personally. Like I, he sees red every time he sees the bonus. And I, I think that Paolo is going to be on that list. And I, I think he's going to really show up for that one. Uh, Franz looked really good the other night for them. And so, you know, he's going to be, that, that's, I think it'll be a good matchup. They, they, they took, uh, they took the uh, Celtics to the wire. Yeah. They had a really good, they had a really good back and forth. And then they're, they're a solid team, but I expect to take care of business for sure. Yeah. As of today, they're 0-3, really close competitive games. Paolo looks great. Franz looks amazing. Wendell Carter Jr. is playing really well. That was, what a, what a huge get for them as a return for Vucevic. So I'm, yeah, we're not looking past the magic. The magic are a good scrappy team, a ton of respect for them, but the Knicks schedule uh, from my recollection really tightens up after that Hornets game. So we are still going to have to frame this magic game as one of those games you're supposed to win because you got to be conscious of what's on the schedule. You know, it's going to get a little bit more difficult for you. This is a good, fun, scrappy young magic team, but a team that Jalen Brunson, RJ Barrett, Julius Randle, Evan Fournier, former Magic, and, you know, one of the Knicks' oldest players. These guys should be able to take care of Orlando, and I think they will. To to put it in perspective, the Magic lost to the Pistons. We should beat them. Like (laughs) Nothing more needs to be said. That's always how I've approached it since I was very young. It's like, how can we lose to this team? There's no way. We beat the team that beat them. Um, I think that's about all we've got for those first two games. So, you know, thank you guys so much for listening. Hope you guys enjoy the Hornets preview. And until next time, signing off. Um, I hate Sean, Sean Geddes. And I call I Dean am Joanna. Dean Joanna, uh, Twitter handle, the way it's spelled. Dean Joanna. No I'm real- I, I just realized, Long for those who watch on YouTube who aren't most people, I realize I'm pointing the wrong way when I say it. So, <laughs> Dean Joanna. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, also, I just said no spaces on my Twitter handle. There's no spaces in anyone's Twitter handle, so it's it's early. It's Sunday. No spaces on the Twitter handle. That's hilarious. <laughs> Do you enjoy <it>? no spaces? <laughs> yeah, keep it in oh, mind. No spaces. Never forget. Columbia, Columbia, Columbia.